Welcome to the PEAT tutorial on clustering or unsupervised classification. Subvolume alignment and averaging implicitly assume identical particles. In this tutorial, we'll look at some of the tools PEAT provides for detecting and dealing with possible heterogeneity in the data. Throughout the tutorial, we'll use Chlamydomonas axoneme data, kindly provided by Tom Heuser and Danny Nicastro of Brandeis University. These data can be downloaded from the URL shown on your screen. For further details, please see the Heuser et al. 2012 article shown there. In the tutorial's top-level directory, you can see that we have two volumes with associated models and initial motive lists, labeled PWT and 6E6. The PWT data are from a pseudo-wild-type revertent strain, which is functionally and structurally normal. The 6E6 data are from a mutant with slightly impaired mobility and structural defects in the flagella. In the PEAT subdirectory, I've created project directories for each of these strains. Additionally, I've created a directory labeled Both, which uses both volumes to artificially create a heterogeneous data set. I've already run alignments in each of these directories. If we open the pseudo-wild-type average, you can see that we're looking at the top portion of a longitudinal cross-section through the axoneme. The central microtubule pair is just off the bottom of the screen, and you can see radial spokes 1 and 2 running between the central apparatus and the A-tubule of the microtubule doublet near the top of the screen. Chlamydomonas also has a characteristic shortened radial spoke 3. In contrast, if we look at the 6E6 mutant strain, radial spoke 3 has completely disappeared, and radial spoke 2 nearly so. Radial spoke 1, while present, appears less distinct than in the wild type. In our artificial mixture, the resulting average appears very similar to the wild type, with the main difference being loss of intensity in some structures. Loss of intensity like this can result from flexibility in a homogeneous structure or from a heterogeneous mixture of a small number of discrete configurations. Of course, there's really a continuum of possibilities between these two extremes. Let's see how we might use the tools Pete provides to check for discrete heterogeneity. To do so, we'll use principal components analysis followed by k-means clustering. Both are well-known mathematical techniques which have been described extensively in the literature. While it's not appropriate to repeat those descriptions here, let me give you a very brief overview. A key problem is that most standard clustering techniques, including k-means, don't work well when you have too many features or dimensions. Even the small binned averages used here contain 125,000 voxels, far too many to try to cluster using the voxels themselves as features. Principal components analysis allows us to identify a small number of vectors or directions in this high dimensional space, which capture as much of the variance in the data as possible. By summarizing each aligned particle by its projections along the first few directions, we reduce the number of features to something manageable. Pete provides a program PCA to perform principal components analysis in a way that attempts to compensate for missing tomographic data. Please consult the article listed on the PCA man page if you'd like more details on how this is done. Seeding down into the both subdirectory, I'll run this program, PCA, using the existing alignment. Because we have a limited number of particles, I'll use all the available data. With larger data sets, you may wish to exclude some fraction to allow for misaligned or damaged particles. To run PCA, I'll specify the parameter file name, the final alignment iteration number, the number of particles to process, and finally, the average volume to take as an estimate of the true volume when performing missing wedge correction. Typically, this will be an average created with the same number of particles as are being analyzed. The PCA program is compute and memory intensive and should be run on a fast computer with large amount of memory. Roughly 32 gigabytes of memory are recommended for 600 particles of size 140 voxels cubed. Binning, selection of a central subvolume of interest, or single precision computation can be used to reduce memory requirements for large data sets. After completion, the program will display three graphs and then write a large file containing the results of principal components analysis. Writing this file can take some time. 
During this period, the graphs will fail to refresh if moved. Let's take a look at these graphs and see how you use them to decide which principal components are features to use for clustering. Figure 1 plots the fraction of the total variance explained versus the number of features used. In textbook examples, you often see that the first three components account for most of the variance. Unfortunately, real-world data are seldom so accommodating, and typically you look for a knee or a breakpoint in this plot. In this case, we see that there's a knee around 10 components, with these first 10 features accounting for roughly 10% of the total variance. Notice also that if one uses all of the available features, the original data get recreated exactly, so all of the variance is accounted for. Figure 2 is similar, except that it shows a bar graph with heights proportional to the fraction of the variance explained by each of the first 10 features. Finally, Figure 3 shows the distribution of coefficients that result from projecting all of the aligned volumes along each of the first eight components. Here, you look for distributions with multimodal peaks or interesting structure. These are especially promising for clustering. Here, there are suggestions of structure in several of the components. These figures are automatically saved to PDF files, so you can easily go back and re-examine them at a later time. Additionally, the first few principal components themselves are saved as MRC volumes, in case you'd like to examine the candidate features themselves. Finally, the results of principal component analysis are saved in a PCA star.mat file for subsequent use in clustering. Since component 1 showed some structure, let's see what happens if we try to classify the data into two clusters using just the first principal component or feature. To do this, we'll run program cluster PCA. As usual, there's a man page describing this application. The arguments we need are the PEAT parameter or PRM file, the PCA star.mat file created by the PCA program, the number of clusters to try to generate, and which principal components to use for clustering. Here I've specified just the first principal component. The final argument is a list of specific components and not the number of components to use. We'll see further examples of this shortly. As requested, clustering using only feature 1 has split the data into two classes, shown in green and cyan. The results appear highly insignificant using either the Akiiki or Bayes information criteria, however, as shown by the large negative improvement scores compared to a single class. Let's run clustering again with just two classes, but this time using features 1 through 10. Notice that I'm now using a colon to represent a range. You can also use commas to separate individual features or ranges. In this case, the Akiiki criterion, or AIC, shows significant improvement, while the Bayes criterion, or BIC, does not. BIC is typically more stringent, requiring stronger evidence to justify a given level of model complexity. We're now using 10 features and can no longer plot the clusters in the real 10-dimensional feature space. Instead, we show them projected down into the space of the first three features. Notice that there do appear to be well-separated clusters in the data, but two classes are not sufficient to represent them well. Additionally, k-means clustering works best with spherical clusters of roughly the same diameter, which we certainly do not have with just two classes. Looking at the graph, you can count six or more groupings, so let's try clustering again, this time specifying six clusters. Now, both AIC and BIC report extremely high significance. AIC and BIC scale like twice the negative log likelihood ratio, so these improvements correspond to odds of occurring by random chance of roughly e to the minus 600 and e to the minus 400, respectively. With 3D graphs, we can also grab the rotate tool and see that the various classes are indeed well separated. In fact, it appears that even more subclasses may be present, but we have too few data to split things more finely. So let's look at some of the output files created by clustering. As for PCA, the figure showing the resulting clusters is saved both as a PDF file and as a MATLAB figure file. 
The figure file allows the use of the rotation tool if opened in MATLAB. Motive lists prefixed with PCA are also written containing information about the class assigned to each particle. We'll see how to use these files a little later. Finally, IMOD models prefixed with class are created for each of the input volumes, so you can easily examine the spatial distribution of the various classes. Let's open these with 3D Mod V and take a look at our results. First, note that class 1 corresponds almost perfectly to pseudo wild type, while the remaining classes are distributed among the 6E6 mutant. Results like this strongly suggest that class 1 is quite distinct and should really be aligned and averaged separately. Of course, we knew that to be true before starting in this case. Second, if I rotate the 6 6 results to a cross-sectional view, you'll see that there appear to be doublet-specific variations, at least within this particular axoneme. This is currently under investigation. Now consider characterization of the 6 6 data alone. Recall that radial spoke 2 was only faintly visible in this average. Let's investigate the source of this variability. Tom Heuser has created a binary mask for the radial spoke 2 region. Ones are placed in the region of interest and zeros elsewhere. Tools for creating custom binary masks such as this are not supplied with PEAT. You can generate such masks visually in IMOD by drawing contours around the desired region and then running program IMOD MOP. You can also specify them algebraically in MATLAB or in other languages. To use such a mask file during PCA, you manually add a parameter PCAFN particle mask to the parameter file. Note that this mask is independent of the mask used during alignment. I'll run PCA on the 6E6 only alignment using this radial spoke 2 mask. In this case, you can see that the first six features account for more than 20% of the variance, and also that several of them are somewhat structured, so we'll try using features 1 through 6 for classification. I'll run two class clustering using features 1 through 6, and you can see that both AIC and BIC indicate significant improvement over a single class. Class 1 in green appears relatively compact, while class 2 is quite variable and may itself be heterogeneous. Because there are so few points in class 2, we won't try to subdivide it any further, however. Now we'd like to see what the averages of these two classes look like. To do so, we'll need the class information saved in the PCA star modal file. We don't want to lose the original motive list, though, so I'll make a backup of the original and then copy the new one into its place. Next, I'll edit the parameter file and insert, or in this case, uncomment, a select class ID parameter saying that I only want to see results from class 1. For creating class averages, frequently you'll only want a single average rather than averages with various numbers of particles. You'll also need to be careful that your class average doesn't override an average from the previous alignment. You may need to rename or move the previous averages to avoid this. In this specific case, list thresholds already specifies a single average using all available particles. And since we know that neither class contains as many particles as the original average, there's no need to do anything special. To generate the class average, I can manually invoke average all, specifying that I'm only interested in generating the average, and not the reference, from the final iteration, which was iteration 3. When the average is complete, I'll rename it, adding a prefix of class 1 to remind myself where it came from. I'll repeat these operations off-screen for class 2, and then we can take a look at the resulting class averages in 3D mod. You can see that class 1, with 129 particles, is missing both radial spokes 2 and 3. Class 2 is much smaller, with just 33 particles, but contains both radial spokes 1 and 2, while radial spoke 3 is still missing. So axonemes within the mutant 6E6 strain are themselves heterogeneous, with radial spoke 2 missing in most, but not all, cases. So now you've seen a quick overview of some of the tools Pete provides for characterizing and managing heterogeneity. We hope you'll find these tools useful and informative on your own data.